I'd like you to keep my sister in prayers. It was kind of rough seeing her in the condition that she's in and knowing that according to the medicals she'll be getting in worse shape in the next couple of months. She she really doesn't know she's still around. She, her body temperature, she can't tell. She really doesn't know whether she's hot or cold. She can't see. And the doctors say that if before the end comes, she will not be able to speak. But even though she is there, occasionally she knows that God hasn't left her because she'll sing, Jesus loves me. And that's comforting. But we had a good trip other than that. And I'd like to just to take an opportunity, a moment to say that if you don't have anything to do this afternoon, at 2 o'clock at Brownstown Baptist, we're having a patriotic service. It'll last probably about a half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, a patriotic music, and we have it every year, and it's fairly good. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for your love. And Lord, we thank you how you watch over and care for us each day, every moment of each day. And Lord, we just pray that you will speak to us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. If you will, open your Bible this morning to the book of Jonah. And I'd like to begin by reading a what the Nelson Illustrated Bible Commentary has to say about the book of Jonah. It is a mistake, and then in parentheses, based in part on the difficulty some readers have in coming to terms with the miraculous character of the story, end of quotes, to assume that the person, events, and actions of the book are not historical in nature. While the storyline is unusual, it is, pers it is presented as normal history. Further, Jesus used the story of Jonah as an analogy of his own impending death and resurrection in Matthew 12, 39. Jesus' analogy depends on the recognition of two historical realities. The historical experience of jo Jonah in the belly of, a great of the great fish, the historical experience of the repentance of the people of Nineveh based on the preaching of Jonah in Luke 29:32. The phrase, the sign of the prophet uh, Jonah, must have been a reoccurring phrase in the teachings of Christ, for it is found in more than one occasion in Matthew's account of Christ's ministry. Any view of Jonah that does not assume that does that assume it does not describe historical events is obliged to explain away the clear words of Jesus to the contrary. The book of Jonah differs from the other minor prophets. It is more of a it is a narrative, biographical, rather than prophetic. And as I read it, it to me, it is telling us in all the things that God is in control of everything. In the story, it is the story of a servant, it's the story of a storm, and of the sovereign God. Jonah's God called, John is, Jonah is God's called, this is man, 
throughout the story. And Jonah himself is a strange paradox. He is a, a prophet of God, yet fleeing from God. He is thrown into the sea, yet alive. A preacher of repentance, yet needing repentance. It is, he is pictured as sanctified in spots, self-willed, godly, courageous, prayerful, obedient after chastisement, bigoted, concerned with his own reputation, zealous for God, And if all that isn't enough, Jonah is a great missionary book. And, a, and Jonah himself is a great evangelist. We first men, find Jonah, and I mention him in 2 Kings chapter 14, when he is, if, goes to the king to prophesy in Israel. Now, as we go through this, the book, as we look this morning, don't get the idea that I'm going to be a long sermon from each chapter, each verse, as we go through. I'm going to just use a few verses as we go along to show us that Jesus, that Jonah was a rebellious prophet. He was a, re he was a repentant prophet. He was a uh, recommissioned prophet and that he was a very raging prophet at the very end. Jonah didn't change from beginning to the end. From the beginning of the book to the end, Jonah remains the same in character. In the verses one and, chapter one, verses one and two, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, Get up, go to that great city Nineveh and preach against it because the evil has come up before me. Jonah got up to flee to Tarsus from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarsus. He paid the fare and went down into, into it to go with them to Tarsus from the Lord's presence. God spoke to Jonah. Now, whether he spoke in a dream or spoke audibly or what, we don't know. But he instructed Jonah to go to the wicked city of Nineveh and to cry out against it because of its wickedness. This word from God is a definite word. It's a disturbing word. And it is a disobeyed word. Jonah, in verse 3, clearly, he very clearly understood God's word he was uncomfortable with it, and he was unwilling to obey God's word, what God had called him to do. He acted as people often do who don't like what God asked them to do. He rebelled. He ran away, attempting to remove himself as far as possible from being under the influence of God. God said, go to Nineveh. That is east of where he lived. There's a uh, writer back in the younger days of our country says, go west, young men. He went west. He went as far west as he could possibly go. Tarsus was a city in Spain, which at that time, that was as far as the world was known. They, from there, they thought that the water just went out and then dropped off into nothing. They didn't know the world was around. They didn't know anything about the Americas, or anything over in this way. So he got as far away from God as he possibly could get. And he clearly understood that God's word, and when he found it so uncomfortable, and he had reasons to believe, because when you go back and read in 2 Kings 14, there, Israel has been doing great, but they have been they have been overrun. They have been 
have an enemy that is constantly nagging him, constantly at him, and it is Assyria, which Nineveh happens to be a part. So he goes away. And then he gets as far away as he possibly can. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He, don't, he doesn't like the Ninevites at all. He, and when God asks him to go, he don't want to go. And we're going to see why he don't want to go later on. Now, then in verses 4 through, 4 through 16 of chapter 1, we see the truths that embedded there include the directed storm, the discovered sin, and the devoted sailors. What does Jonah do? He goes down to Java. He gets aboard this ship that's going to Spain, the opposite direction from which God tells him. Disobedience. And as he, they cast out and they get out from shore a little bit, a storm comes in verse 1, chapter 1. A storm comes, and it gets worse and worse and worse. It gets stronger and stronger, and the waves become more, even more rolling and tumbling, and the ship is about to break up or fall apart. They lay aside and cast off all the cargo they possibly can. Where's Jonah? He's asleep down in the bottom of the ship. So the captain of the ship goes down and wakes him up and tells him about what the situation and that they're about to sink and, did, and says, what about your God? We've the sailors have all called on their own gods. And it must have been a multi-ethnic group of sailors because it says each called to his own god. Different gods, different ones. No help whatsoever. Kind of like when Elijah, you remember when the, he was had the priest of Baal and he was laughing and mocking because the fire didn't come down and consume the altar, the altar of Baal. And, and uh, Isaiah said, well, you know, uh, not Isaiah, but, uh, uh, but anyway, they didn't consume the altar, offering. And he mocked them and laughed on and went on. It's kind of just that's what we get here. These sailors have prayed to their gods, and their gods has been no help. The captain wakes Jonah up. Jonah comes up to where the captain is. They cast lots. The lot falls to the fact that it is Jonah's the reason the storm is coming and the storm is there. And Jonah tells him. He tells him what he's doing, why he's on the ship, why he's running from God, and that his God is in control of the wind, the winds, his of creation, his God is in control of everything. The sailors, and then he tells them, says, Now, if you'll just throw me overboard, things will turn out all right. The storm will cease. The sailors, the devoted sailors, they don't want to do that. So they row harder and harder and harder, and the storm gets worse and worse. And they do everything they possibly can. And then finally, as a last resort, they toss Jonah into the sea. And immediately, the sea becomes calm. And what do those sailors do? They offer sacrifice and worship Jonah's God. Here's Jonah. He's already in the sea. I like to, you know, when Jesus came to the, the sailors on the Sea of Galilee during the storm and he's walking on the water, and then when the, he stepped into the boat, he said they immediately reached shore. I wonder if maybe what happened here, now this is just my imagination, and I do have an active imagination, that as soon as those sailors that... As soon as Jonah's body hit the water, the sea became calm. I wonder if that boat ended up in Tarsus. Just like that. I don't know. It don't say. But God could do it. They realized 
that God was in control of the weather. They realized that God was in control of everything. And then we come to chapter 2. Jonah prayed. Jonah's in the fish's belly. The fish is swallowed him. Come to chapter 2. And Jonah, from the fish's belly, prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish. I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. Jonah doesn't realize what has happened on that boat. That the storm has ceased and everything. The sailors do. Jonah has been a missionary and he's brought a message and he's done something for God that he doesn't even realize he did. He led some people. Maybe we don't know whether they became Christians or whether this is just a one time a thing for him for worshiping God, but he led, brought that group of sailors to worship God without even knowing it. Because when he's in the belly of the fish, then he prays to God. God hears him. And here in these verses, from 4 through 16, the truth embedded in these verses include the directed storm, the discovered sin, sin of disobedience of Jonah, and the devoted sailors. Then we have the handy fish. Jonah hits the water. As he's going down, along comes the fish and swallows him. The sailors threw Jonah into the raging sea, and a large fish swallowed Jonah, Jonah whole. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And the truth is found in this verse include, include the prepared fish, the providential fact, the prophetic figure, and the prophet's faith. And then, here he is. He's praying to God, and the Lord delivers him. And then in verse 10, the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now, here in this chapter is the repentant prophet. The repentant servant speaks in verses 1 through 9. The verses record Jonah's supplication, his suffering, this, his statement, and his submission, and his singing. Verse 9, Jonah's prayer reveals a note of triumph. He prayed himself out of the belly, the fish's belly, and did so with absolute confidence in God and in his deliverance. He believed it when he prayed from the fish's belly that he would be delivered out, and he was. He had confidence in it. He had disobeyed God. God had disciplined, and now he abandoned his disobedience and vowed to be obedient, to obey God's word. And that brings us into to verse 10, where then the Lord commanded the, the fish and the vomited him Jonah onto dry land, and then we see that the second part here, the recommissioned prophet, the willing prophet, in verses of chapter 3, 1 through 4. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Here he is, recommissioned. Get up, go into that great city of Nineveh, and preach the message that I tell you. Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. The people, he goes to the second chance. And I want to tell you, the Bible is full of people who got second chances. Peter, Thomas, John Mark, and Samson just an example of people that got second chances. God is a God of second chances. He gives everyone a second chance. So 
so God disciplines Jonah for his rebellion. He repents, and the word comes to him the second time. And this time, he is more than willing and ready to obey God's word. He recognized the second chance and, un, and un, was undeserved. It was unexpected. It was unparalleled, and it was in, unique. God did not change Jonah's task. God did not say, okay, Jonah, you don't want to go to Nineveh, so you can go over in the coast of Africa and preach over there. No, he did not change Jonah's task. His task was still the same. Go to Nineveh and preach against that city. And Jonah went. So God didn't change the task. He changed the messenger to make him willing to go. And then the people, we have in verses 5 through 9 of 3, the people of Nineveh responded to the message of Jonah. They believed his message, and it affected their behavior. Have you ever read there that, in, as you're reading through there, that they, the, the king preached, told them about how wicked they were, and he repented and put on sackcloth and ashes and told the people to do it, and even put sackcloth on the cattle. They repented. They really repented. They believed. And God, and they begged God not to do what he had planned to do. They beseeched him in verses 8 and 9. God saw their conduct. He saw what they did, and he spared the city. Divine judgment was averted. Chapter 3. Jonah's preaching. And then we come to chapter 4. This is the chapter that I kind of like, in a way. It says, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord. Please, Lord, isn't this what I thought while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarsus in the first place. I knew that you are gracious, you are a compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. What's Jonah saying? Back in the, the one that said he, he got just fled. Now we know why. Because he knew that if he did and what God had asked him to do in the first place, that the city would repent and they would repent and he would be looked upon in his town as someone that was a traitor because he had take, gone and preached to the Nineveh, uh, the enemies of the people of Israel, and they had repented and God had spared them and it's all Jonah's fault. That was Jonah's thinking. It was my fault. That's why I didn't go because I knew what would happen. He knew God. He knew what God would do. He knew that God was a loving God. God was a forgiving God. And he knew that when he preached and the people repented, God would relent. He knew it. He said, that's why I went to cause the boat going to Tarsus in the first place. And then he says, and now, Lord, take my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. I think along about here, this willing prophet, this prophet, was angry. He knew because he knew what God would do. He knew that if he did what God had asked him to do and he went back home, that he wouldn't be given the keys to the city. He would be looked on as a traitor in his. And then we come down a little further in this chapter. So Jonah left the city, found a place east of it, 
made himself a shelter, and sat down to see what would happen to the city. He's still not convinced. He's afraid that God's going to change his, or not afraid, but he thinks that there's a possibility that God's going to change his mind again and punish Nineveh, which is his desire. That's what Jonah wanted. And so he sits down to see what's going to happen. And then God appointed a plant to grow over Jonah to provide shade for his head to rescue him for his trouble. I've read that sometimes that the east wind blows and that temperature in that area will get up to about 20 or 30 degrees above normal when certain winds blow and it was hot and it was blowing and it was it was miserable and he was miserable so God caused this plant to grow and as it grows grows shades Jonah someone I read that this is the castor oil plant and we know what the castor plant isn't very good is a poisonous plant but a castor oil plant. It grows big leaves and shade. And so it does, and he sits there and he watches and think nothing happens and nothing happens. And then the next morning we've noticed that God has caused the worm to enter that plant. And he's entered that plant and he destroys that plant. And it withered. And then as the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun to bear down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted. And he wanted to die. It is said it is better to die than to live. And then God says, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And what did Jonah say? Yes, it is, he, yes, it is right. It is right. I'm angry enough to die. He was angry at God. Can you imagine it? What he has seen and been through and seen God do, that now he's angry with God? Well, that's the way a lot of us are, aren't they? Aren't we? God does, we do something, and we pray for God to do something, and he does it, and he doesn't do it the way we want it done, and it makes us angry at him. That's Jonah. That's Jonah. And then he said, the Lord said, you care about this plant which you did not labor over, did not grow, it appeared in the night, and it perished in the night. But it, may I not care about the great city of Nineveh? Jonah, you've got more concern over this plant than you have over the people of Nineveh. More concern. This great city of Nineveh with more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right hand and their left, as well as many animals. You don't care, Jonah, about this, all these people. Wow. Can you imagine it? God has called him to go. He knows God. He's a prophet of God and has been for years. He disobeys God. God relents. Repents, he repents to God, and God spares his life. And now here he is back again in the same way he was in the beginning. He didn't want to go to Nineveh, and he didn't go. He was punished, and now here he is still angry because God saved that city. And he's angry with God. God changed him to go, but he really didn't change him inside, did he? Jonah was still in rebellion. He still didn't want Nineveh to be saved. 
He didn't want Nineveh to hear of the message that God had. Let me ask you, have you, God, ever given you, kind of told you to go to someone that you didn't like to tell them about his love and about his salvation and you didn't go at first but then you decided later that you would do what God said and you went but then even though God answered the, the prayer and he maybe saved that person that you went to you were still angry because you didn't like that person to begin with and that hasn't changed a bit you still don't like that person This was Jonah. This was what Jonah did. Let's look at, at him. And, and the whole book says God's in control. God sent the storm. God sent the fish. God cre sent the, created the plant. God created the little worm. And God created the stone winds to come again. And God was in control the whole time. As we look at and read through the book of Jonah, it is clearly evident that God is in control of everything at all times. And that hasn't changed since then. God is still in control of everything. No matter how bad this world gets today, no matter how bad it seems to you and I, and how everything is going against what you and I believe, God is still in control. Nothing is beyond his control it's all working according to his plan he has a plan has had from the beginning and he's going to see that plan through to the end this was Jonah this was God's plan for Nineveh he didn't change God, Jonah's mission he did change the man. Did make him, even though he was still unwilling and still didn't like the Ninevites, he made it so that Jonah would go and do what he wanted to do. Maybe that's what he's telling us today. That we may not like certain things, but to go and cry out against them. And he will take care of the situation. Father, we thank you for your day, the day. We thank you for your love. We thank you that the message this morning that lets us know that you are in control. You're still in control. You have always been in control and you always will be. That nothing is beyond what you can control. And Lord, help us to be willing and obedient servants and do what you want us to do individually, where and how you want, it to do, you want us to do it, and not be like Jonah and rebel, but be like those other servants of yours that we read about in the Bible who obeyed willingly, not grudgingly, but help us to be your willing servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.